guys. Um, so yeah. Uh, so back to my questions, just quickly, if anybody can tell me, how does an anxious person look like? Um, this first thing that comes up into your mind. Um, yeah. Nervous, unfocused. Okay. All right, so the question is, how does somebody look like who is deep, oh, all right, deep in life, Ikra, you're saying? So the question is, how does somebody actually look like who is nervous or unfocused or deep in life? How are you able to actually see that from somebody who's walking? So, see, the thing is, the, the pop, you can't really tell. Yes, sometimes it's not, um, as right, you can't always really tell if somebody is anxious. So the reason why I'm asking this is because I want to tell you that. Um, so I had this friend who um, was a medical student, and generally, medical students are known for um, struggling with stress and mental health struggles. And um, so basically, this this friend I have in their class, there was somebody who got diagnosed with cancer. So so what happened was that that class, they tried to do different kind of fundraising. They tried to support this person as much as they could. They tried to um, they they tried to bring more awareness about it, um, which is a really really good thing. But the 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 thing that stru struck me was that probably you've got seventy five percent of the people in 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 this course who who are struggling with mental health, nobody speaks about it. So this physical um, struggle that somebody's having is more apparent. You can see it. So it's more easier to be able to support someone, to be able to raise awareness about it, um, to put up fundraisings for it. But when it comes to mental health, that's something that you not, you cannot always see. And there's people struggling about it. So the question is, why isn't there so much awareness about this? And that's why this, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that this um, project is going on with Pulses, Mind Over Chatter, uh, because we need more awareness like these. So another thing I want to ask you guys is, um, what when you think about anxiety and stress, is it the same thing or different? Different? Okay. Anybody else? All right. Do they do they link? Yeah. Well, that is the thing that we can ask. Um, so the thing is, stress is something that comes to us due to external factors, right? Um, which um, could be because of, for example, work or money problem that we have. But anxiety, sorry, wait, sorry, my thing was not different as the cause of stress can usually be identified. Yes, exactly. My point here, um, which is that um, stress is something that can be identified. It's more from external factors. But anxiety is something which, first of all, it's a very broad term and it's something that can persist whether you know if the co what the cause of it is, whether it's clear or not. And generally, man, many of you have probably heard about the fight or flight response uh, that is built within us, which is basically like a uh, an internal alarm system to our body when a danger is near us, right? And we have a boost of adrenaline, which then increases our heart rate and increases our oxygen level, oxygen levels. However, um, when we are anxious, when we have anxiety, instead of there actually being danger, there is kind of a fight or flight um, symptom, symptoms that are activated when there has been kind of like a stress built up within us unknowingly, without us knowing what the cause is. And it can sometimes be that we have butterflies in our stomach instead, or it can sometimes even be that we've got like a burning sensation in our stomach or a weight that has been put on our chest. Um, and this is where some of us 
can some of us can identify that it is anxiety and some of us we don't know if, if it is anxiety or not so i want you to think about so if giving more a visual representation about this i want you to think about a box or or even a suitcase you know and in there we are putting in these small stress triggers um, that happen in our life and then we're just putting them in slowly and slowly until it starts to get over full and then we're trying to push push it down and you know trying to put it um put it to the side and um, because we think you know we're able to manage them or we're able to de deal with it or it's nothing or I, I just need to block it out it's okay these stress that stress triggers that i have or these small stress um events and what happens is because it starts overflowing the box just completely just opens up and starts you know shoving up all of these things that you have inside or if you look into a suitcase you know you, some of you guys probably know like sometimes when you go abroad and um if you if you have relatives that live abroad and you're getting them presents you're getting them things and sometimes your parents they just overflow things um into the suitcase and you literally have to like sit on the suitcase and close that suitcase and and what can happen is if it's too much it will rip so it's the same kind of effect there basically um if you put in too much and that's where your anxiety can build up to an extent where you don't know how to handle it so the the thing here is um about working with the things you put in the box so these um small stress triggers that you put in um or and being able to identify them um, and then being able to manage them in a way that suits you best so you know different things could be exercising reading writing drawing talking to someone going to a therapist or, you know even doing dicker so just something that i want to point out as well uh, is that i know me mentioning um dicker here i'm not insinuating the fact that um you know how people point out that if you have islam and you've got faith um, that means you're not going to have any mental health struggles in your life nothing's going to happen that's not what i'm saying i'm saying more that it being a mean of tools of us to be able to manage these small stress triggers that we can have it's it's one of the things that's something that you know um we need to figure out as well um yeah so my next question to you guys is when is anxiety a problem do you guys know when because the thing is um all of us will feel anxious sometimes in our life right and um, sometimes some people experience it more than others but the 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 issue when anxiety becomes a problem is when it's more frequent frequent or severe than what you're used to uh, and what i'm hearing people say or what people are saying here so when it affects your day-to-day -day activities when it disrupts your ability to carry on with the day-to-day -day tasks stop you from doing daily tasks stops you from progressing or reaching your potential and when you're unable to do things yeah so so basically a bit more what i'm saying in terms of that when something is when you experience that the that the problem the anxiety problem is more frequent and severe than you're used to and it it stops your mobility for example as not being able to do daily tasks or progressing or reach your potential yeah uh, so one so one thing to remember is that anxiety is not a diagnosis um as such but it has a big impact um on an individual and it can have a huge impact and therefore there are these different type of anxiety conditions such as different phobias and um, it can be post-traumatic stress disorder social anxiety etc etc now i wanted to start talking generally briefly about anxiety because um 
that's something that was in the in the topic friendship causing anxiety so um i'm going to be bringing up a little brief um topics here and then tie it in the end and therefore um i want to continue on talking about relational needs now um uh, just quote, quote here which says to be human is to be in relation with others. Now, we have a biological need for attachment or the need to be in, a, in, in some kind of relationship. So um, it's a fundamental aspect of our growth. This can be all from your mother, your father, your siblings, teacher, friends, your husband, your wife, etc. Because we quite, we require a contactful presence of another person uh, who is who is more sensitive and attuned to basically our relational needs now the relational needs i'll speak more about them um briefly a bit more about them a little later um but basically somebody who can respond to the, our relation needs in a way where they are where they are satisfied where they become satisfied and relational needs is something that is present throughout our life you know, from an infancy to an old age. Um, we do not outgrow this need. And um, even as adults, we attach to other people because we perceive them as being able to satisfy our variety of needs. And this is one of the reasons. And when our relationship needs are met, we have the capacity to be more creative to know how to be close to someone uh, while being able to carry ourselves to be more expansive. But when they aren't met, we have a lot more, uh, uh, we experience a sense of insecurity, emotional disturbance, um, and we can adapt to this insecurity by developing um, different kind of attachment styles or patterns that, that compensate or the disruption that we have in a relationship. By the way, guys, if I'm if if I'm going too quick or there's something that you feel you're not understanding, then please do stop me. Um, so the insecure attachment styles and patterns are a result of basically not having the relational needs met. And they can endure over a long period of time. So it's something that can change or continue have or continue with you um, from your childhood through your adult life. Uh, now, relational needs are unique to interpersonal contact. Now, what do I mean with interpersonal contact? So they are basically not the basic or physiological needs of life, such as food um, or having a house or money. It's basically what it means is the essential psychological elements that basically enhance um, the quality of our life, the, devel the development of a positive sense of ourself and ourself in a relationship with somebody else, which again is, which again can be anyone, can be a teacher, your mom, your dad, your siblings, etc. Uh, now, the the um so there is a guy named Erskine and he talked about there being eight specific relational needs for us um and that we generally have a human desire to have close relationship and secure attachment now in order for that to happen he talked about uh the need first to have security the um wanting to have validation affirmation um and and having a sig and having significance within a relationship and um, having acceptance from others by a stable dependent dependable and protective other person and number four is confirmational confirmation of personal experiences Five is self-definition. Um, six is having an impact on, on the other person. Seven is being able to have the other person to initiate things. And eight is to expressing love. Now that can be in different ways. So I'm generally just skimming through these 
things just to have a um, better idea about when I talk about friendships a little later. Um, so from as we talk about these relational needs when they sometimes cannot be met, we can create um, different types of attachment styles. Sorry, before I go on to that, I wanted to show you guys a video. Now I'm hoping this is possible to do. Uh, let's see. And this video I just want to show is basically the importance of the relational needs as we are children um, and how we can detect that um, as an infant. Now, my question is if you guys can see this. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. And it's still phase experiment what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age I like a girl. Oh. and she gives a greeting to the baby the baby gives a greeting back to her yeah. this baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her they're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions what they want to do in the world and that's really what the baby is used to and then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby the baby very quickly picks up on this and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back she smiles at the mother she points because she's used to the mother looking where she points the baby puts both hands up in front of her and says what's happening she makes that screechy sound at the mother like come on why aren't we doing this even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction they react with negative emotions they turn away they feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their, their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh, what a big girl. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids the bad is when something bad happens but the infant can overcome it after all when you stop the still face the mother and the baby start to play again the ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good there's no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation Thank you so much for uh, showing that. Uh, so I can see some people have might, might have seen this before. It's a quite common um, videos um, that we see, especially if you study psychology, whether that's in A levels or in uni. So. Um, somebody's got their mic on. Somebody, if everybody could just mute their mics, that would be really helpful. Could everyone just mute their mics, please? 
Uh, everyone is muted, uh, Sudra. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm I'm hearing somebody's um, TV. That's why. I was. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now it's all muted. Okay. Perfect. So. Um, so this comes in a bit about uh, attachment styles. Um, in terms of how we bond or how the the how our relationships are with for example our primary caregiver and how that can affect in terms of how we relate to other people so we have these four different ones which is we can have a secure attachment you can have an anxious attachment an avoidant or disorganized so briefly just about it um so we have, uh, for example, somebody with a secure attachment is when for their caretaker enjoys uh, satisfying the, ch the child's relational needs, such as validation, the need for companionship, uh, the need to have someone stronger or wiser to be able to lean on. And um, they usually feel that it's easy when they become adults, they feel it's easier for them to become emotionally close to others you comfortable depending on others and having others depend on them. Um, you know, you don't worry about being alone or others not accepting, um, not others not accepting you. Now, these other three ones, the anxious, avoidant, and disorganized, are more of a insecure attachments that we can that we can have. So the anxious anxious one, um is somebody who relate, relates to that they feel completely em, um, emotionally close to others, but they often find that others are reluctant to get um, close to them as they would like to, or they are uncomfortable being um, without any kind of close relationship. So in this case, we can say friendships, um, and they worry that the others won't value them as much as they value other people. So uh this uh, this reminds me of uh, a friend I had who would always um, I remember they would all they could when so when they were like when it was charity week at uni or when they were in kind of tricks even though they had a lot of uni work even though they were feel not feeling good they would still get up do all of this because they, they felt if they didn't do this, if they didn't participate in charity week events, um, they would be dismissed by other people. And they felt that um, they, had to, they had to go extra. So they had some event where they went to a trick, I think, and then this person had been up until 12, um, 12 a.m. to the night for the, I think it was a charity week dinner the the night before and then 3 a.m in the morning they wake up they woke up made sandwiches for everyone all of their friends uh, went to the trek and still felt disappointed because they felt that other people uh, didn't value them enough didn't um, um, yeah basically they were feeling like everything was because ev they were feeling bad because everybody else didn't give them the time and attention that they wanted so this is a lot how an anxious and preoccupied person can uh, behave like where as thinking that there might be other options to why people are behaving the way they are. Um, a avoidant um, uh, individual, and that can be a dismissive avoidant um, individual, they feel comfortable um, without any kind of close relationships. Um, they feel it's important to feel independent and that they are self-sufficient. They don't want to depend on anybody else and, and they don't want others to depend on them. Um, they tend to uh, suppress or hide their feelings and they deal with rejection by distancing themselves um, from any kind of rejection that you know they can get. So that can be friends or family. Um, so uh, uh, this is another friend I have, which um, I know has this kind of behavior, and I know that if ever I try to get close to her, she will start distancing herself. Um, and that's for me to understand as well that that's not that person rejecting me. It's something within them that's going on 
when somebody comes too close, they don't they don't like it. They can't deal with it. Um, and then we've got the disorganized, or it can be the fearful and avoidant um, person. And this is usually somebody who's had who's had some kind of trauma or some kind of loss um, in their past, um, and they are somewhat uncomfortable getting close to other people and um, they do want emotionally close uh, relationships or friendships but they find it difficult to trust others completely because of the past history and um, they find it difficult to be able to depend on other people as well and they worry that they'll be hurt if they allow themselves to become too close to other people and, and so it's it's a bit of like a battle within themselves where they don't know um, what they should do. It's like they want to become distant, but at the same time, they want to be able to close to people as well. And so what happens is they learn um, sometimes to soothe themselves when they need somebody else. So they learn different kind of coping, coping strategies as they grow. So the thing is, the reason why I'm talking about these different attachment styles is be, to be able for us to understand why we have such different kind of friendships with different kind of people. But um, I'm going to skip this now with, because of the time. But this is um, basic. Uh, you guys can watch this later. I can, I can send you the link. This is a video called uh, Strange Situations. It's quite popular one as well. Um, if, you, if you study psychology in A-level, you've probably seen it, which is showing how infants um, react to uh, mothers um, in different ways and that shows um, what kind of attachment style the baby has. So what they do in the in the experiment is that the baby is in a room with the with the caretaker and they're playing with toys or something like that and then the mom goes out for a little bit and then naturally the, the child starts crying because they're yearning for the mom and when the mom comes back the way the, the the infant reacts shows a lot about how, how what kind of attachment style the the child has. So if there's somebody who likes to avoid, or if there's somebody who is anxious, they will still cry even though the mom is there, or they will avoid their mom even though she comes back. If they got more secure, they will stop crying and generally start after a while start playing with toys again. So it's that's basically the gist, but um, it would be good for you guys to watch it. It's a bit, it's a, it's about five minute video, um, but it, it gives a, a better understanding and a visual representation of these attachment styles. So something else that came into this topic um, was to do about um, self doubt. Now, um, that is something that can come up a lot, especially especially when being in university and uh, and also about self-image and about friendships and how people see themselves. So, you know, we have, we, I can go on in, on another webinar just about self-doubt and self-image. And, um, you know, we've got people who've got eating disorders, body dysmorphia, et cetera, et cetera. And um, being in a sphere where we've got the social media around us a lot, uh, the image of how students should be and the illusion about how you're connected to people can have detrimental effects, uh, you know, in terms of what is expected from you, what is expected from the students, how should you dress, how should you be, you know, especially being in, in ISOC, um, some people can have this battle between, especially for girls in terms of hijab and you know how we now have more and more people where some people are wearing them, some people are taking them off, um, especially celebrity, not celebrities, but people that you know we're relating to um, and have a high profile. It can get us very confused and it can start giving us self-doubt and looking at degenerative to relational needs and attachment styles that can come up a lot as well. So what is the reason that I'm saying all of this? That is to do because of our main topic, which is to do about friendships, right? Uh, we've talked about anxiety. We've talked about relational needs. We've talked about the attachment theory and just 
brief, we briefly touched about self-image and self-doubt. Um, and so how we relate to others and how we are in friendships can help us to make meaning of ourselves as well in terms of um, how we are relating to these people. Um, so our friends ha do have a big impact on us, especially when we're going to uni and if we're living alone and friends are, you know, first source of people that we see. Um, so there was a friend that I had who was diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder. And she lived in a house with four other girls. And um, now this had a huge impact on her where she felt depressed as well. And it was hard for her to maintain with everything she was doing um, in terms of university, not, not university wise. So what happened was that she um, failed uh, the first year uh, because of being depressed. And this had a big impact on um, on the other girls that she was living with, to the to the extent where these other girls had to actually put in extenuating circumstances for all the coursework. So this just shows about how uh, big of an impact our friends can have. Other cases that you've probably heard of, heard of as well is that when we come to university, we can be um, fearful of being isolated right not having any friends and um, and therefore we easily tend to uh, we can easily tend to conform to people that we usually and to ideas which we usually would not um we, which we do not believe in or which we do not feel comfortable in so you've probably heard um or you might have heard about people who have gone through this so i had a friend as well who um, lived with, uh, she lived in uni halls, right? And outwardly, you wouldn't see that she's very practicing, like in terms of that she wasn't wearing hijab, etc., and stuff. But still, she didn't want to be with friends who were drinking, partying, clubbing, etc. And so she tried to go to the ISOC, but what happened was, um, she felt left out just because she wasn't wearing hijab. She wasn't, she wasn't fitting a picture as such. And, you know, she did not want to be um, isolated. And this, this was a friend who actually uh, moved from Sweden to England and um, to study as well. And because she didn't have anybody there, she wanted some kind of friend. She wanted to relate to people, you know, thinking back about those relational needs that I talked about. So what happened, ended up happening was she was feeling depressed. She started to be with people who were drinking and clubbing. That's what she started to do. And it led to her um, as well um, having to um, having to postpone her year because it was all getting too much. That, that as well shows the importance and impact that friends can have, um, especially when we have that fear of, of of uh, being isolated. Then we also have friends who can be over demanding. Um, with over demanding, it means that they um, expect, they have a lot of expectations of you as a friend, uh, more than what you um, are capable of doing. So um, <laughs> I remember there was, um, once a quiet clingy friend that i had and she so guys you guys are probably thinking oh my god how many friends has this girl had but <laughs> so something for me is that when i moved from sweden to here to uk um i didn't know anyone so for me the the, the big thing that i did was try to become friends with everyone and, and everything and anyone i could see and so therefore I, 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 um, I got to know a lot of different characters and a lot of it made sense while I started to study psychotherapy. So back to the story. So this, um, this friend was quite clingy and it was uh, to the point where she didn't want me to be friends with anybody else. So when I, I remember when I was starting to become close with another friend, 
um, this friend A wanted me, wanted me to either choose that friend uh, or I couldn't be friends with that person with with the friend A if I chose friend B. So so I what I ended up doing was I I I didn't choose. It was more the friend A who chose chose to step back when I was with friend B. Uh, and to be honest, it's it's um, something that I felt something sometimes I feel in, has been a healthy thing for me because I, it, 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 it collided a bit with being a toxic friendship as well, where somebody needed a lot of my time and um, to the point where they're making me feel guilty um, that I'm not there with them. It became to the extent where um when I was with other friends, I could, um, I could, I, I was thinking about this friend A that I'm not there with them. They're feeling abandoned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, but something that I learned was how uh, you know am I compromising myself by being there for that by dropping everything and just being there for that friend, and and are, are they actually growing? Are they actually developing as a person if I'm doing that all the time? And that again comes to, um, you know, if somebody's relational needs are not been met. So, for example, somebody who's um, anxious, preoccupied, where they want this close relationship all the time. And if somebody like starts to back out, they feel that that person is abandoning them. And then they can make this other person feel as as if they're doing something wrong uh, by not being there with them, you know, what, what, what is actually happening um, with them? Guys, sorry, I'm, I'm losing a, tr a bit of track here um, with the toxic relationship, um, probably because it's a toxic topic <laughs> and, and that I've personally been in myself. Um, so what I'm trying to basically say is, when you are thinking about your friendships, are you being a candle who's trying to illuminate others? Are you trying to be there for everybody else while burning yourself out? Uh, or are you trying to take care of yourself as well and be there for others as well? You know, it is not selfish if you are looking at your needs as well um, before you're there for others. Because if you can't be there for yourself, you're going to burn yourself out um, while you can't be there for, um, you're going to burn yourself out and then you can't be there for anybody at all. Um, and this is basically just a picture of, uh, a picture taken from something which we show to people who are in domestic, uh, domestic abusive relationships. And this is just more a pattern of showing about how a, a relationship should be. Now, this can also be applied to friendships as well. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through it all because I'm aware of the time. Um, but it's already 10 to uh, 9. Um, so I'm going to let you, and hopefully these, these slides will be sent to you guys where you can um, read it read it, uh, read it yourself as well um, but this is just generally showing about how a healthy friendship should be you know having respect uh, honest and accountability etc uh, so how do you actually manage um, the anxiety the um, that can come from friendships? So first thing is being able to recognize the patterns that you are in. Are you actually compromising yourself being in it? You know, sometimes we can be in these toxic relationships because we are getting something ourselves. We are, um, there can be a relational need that hasn't been met for us. And we are getting it. We are getting it from being in this relation, uh, this toxic friendship or a friendship just generally where you are compromising yourself. Um, and sometimes, you know, being there for others um, or being helpful for others can go to that extent where you're actually do, doing it because it's soothing your ego, um, which can be hard to hear sometimes. But 
sometimes when we are in a friendship which we don't need to be in is basically because we're getting something from it um, and what we're getting from it can be different things I said one of the things is that it, it might be striking your ego or it might be soothing that ego you know making you feel like a better person you're there you're there um, for somebody else it's making you feel better you're a better person etc etc but at the end of the day um, it can be you again burning yourself out um, and another thing is also when you start to recognize these patterns um, it could be that you need to reach out to somebody else for them to be able to to help you or you need to talk to somebody. Now I'm rushing the management bit about uh, um, management part a bit. But um, I would definitely say a first thing is to be able to recognize the patterns that you that you um, have. And I've generally just put some links here, which is for example the um, anxietyuk.org.uk which has really really helpful tips about somebody who's um, feeling any kind of anxiety um, want to know more about different kind of anxiety disorders um, etc um, and other places that you can call as well for example Samaritans and Muslim Youth Helpline are helplines you can call anytime um, Sukoon is also a uh, a place where you can go and see therapists. You can see them via Skype or in person. They are situated in different places in, uh, in the UK. Their main base, I think, is in London. Um, yeah, um, that is what I have to say. I'm just conscious about time. We've got about five minutes left. Um, so you guys are more than welcome to ask questions. Um, if you're not able to get them answered here, you're more than welcome to email me. My email is up there um, and, I, and I'll be able to do the best I can. So I can already see that there's a question here. Okay, so. Okay, so, sorry, a quick question, question and answers. Um, are you guys going to read it up or do you want me to read the question? It's not if you can answer. Um, yeah, well, I don't mind reading them out. So the first question was, um, is the Muslim youth helpline that you mentioned specific to Muslims? Okay, no, no. Um, it's not specific to Muslims. Anybody can call. Um, it's just more so, um, okay. just more so the reason why it's probably called Muslim Health Fund is for people who feel that they want specifically somebody who has the same background as them and is able to understand them rather than calling them, for example, Samaritans, which is a helpline as well. Um, Isma, I have got a question here, but it's been sent to me privately, I think, so I think you can't read it. That's fine. Um, I was just going to say if anyone else wants to message yourself privately so that no one else can see the question, they can go ahead and do that too, if they're more comfortable. Yeah. I, I'm, I just want to ask, Amina, you have asked me a question. Do you want me to answer that privately or do you want me to answer it here? If you could just let me know. Do what you feel comfortable with. In the meantime, if anybody else has any questions, please do ask. I know I had to rush a bit with the last part with friendships. Um. Okay. Yeah, I will send. I'll send the links. Okay, so I've got a question. What if you feel like 
you yourself are that toxic person. Um, okay, wait, sorry, I'm just trying to see um, questions in this. Okay, what if you feel yourself in the toxic person? Um, this this is this is one thing with question and answers that I uh, I was um, a bit hesitant about actually in the beginning having when it came to these kind of questions because a lot of these things depends individually uh, because if you feel that you are a toxic person and you feel it is affecting your relationships and it is affecting your daily life the best thing i would say to you is to be able to talk to someone about it and um, if you're not able to recognize the patterns basically talking to someone about it so they can recognize your patterns if you feel you cannot do it yourself so i have talked a bit about attachment styles relational needs um, and maybe a bit of and giving answers in terms of why we can behave in a certain way but if it is more in depth in that then um i would say the best thing is either a and um, if you tell me more if you can email me and tell me more about what you mean um, and i can i can tell you um i could give you advice specifically what you could do uh, or i would say for you to reach out to someone if you feel it's affecting your daily life Okay, let's see the next question. Um, what are some uh, practical steps we can take to battle anxiety? Okay, when it comes to anxiety, as I said, it's again a very broad term. General things, as I said, that you can do there and then. So there are, there are actually quite some good apps um, out there. Um, that you can download. One of them, I've actually got one of them on my phone. Uh, it's called SAM. Uh, S A M. Um, it's actually developed by a university here in the UK, the uh, University of the uh, West of England. Um, that basically gives you a tracker of your anxiety, it um, gives you some exercises you can do to. Um, take it down there and then. Um, um, there is, as well as a mood tracker, an anxiety tracker, um, and a place where you can write things. Sometimes people find it um, good by uh, drawing. Some people like it by exercising. Some people like it. Um, there are a lot of different things there. Some. So these are some of the things. Um, it's about trying to, trying out these different things to be able to understand what works for you. That's the main thing that I would be able to say here. Um, okay, in terms of recognizing and knowing your attachment style, what can you do to improve it so you are secure and more balanced? That is a very good question. Um, so the thing is, when you recognize some time, uh, some type of um, attachment style. First of all, I think um, for some people it can be traumatic as well uh, when they get to know the attachment style they are in. Um, to make it more secure, I think first of all always starts with awareness. Having the awareness about it will make it easier for you to understand why you are behaving in a, in a certain way, why you are doing some things that you do. Uh, and then again, it's about finding ways where you are feeling more uh, content within yourself. And, um, you know, if you recognize that, that um, you feel that you want to be close to other people, 
uh, you want to be close, you want to have close friendships, but everybody else is not reciprocating. Okay, okay, so let's step back for a moment. You've recognized that that your attachment style is the anxious one. You recognize that you have this kind of thought pattern. Okay, so is this actually what is uh, happening to you? Um, are the other people not wanting close relationships or is it that you're having these expectations from other people that they need to do X, Y, and Z um, for you to be happy or content, you know? It's about understanding that everybody, that every individual is going to look at things in a different way. You know, it's, for example, if you take two people living in a household one person is tied one person has the nature where they always tidy and the other person is where they untidy so they don't see a big thing that they that they leave um dirty dishes into the sink but the tidy person feels they become anxious they don't like it they don't um they don't um uh, they can't handle basically seeing seeing any kind of dirty dishes over there so you have different kind of perspectives there uh, so, again, it's about being able to understand where the other person is coming from. Uh, I hope that answers a bit of the questions there. Uh, okay, can a family relationship be toxic? Yes, it can. Uh, again, uh, depending on depending on what kind uh, of toxic, uh, toxic nature we take talking about, but it definitely could be. You have people who are in a household where, you know, the mom or dad uh, are in an abusive relationship. And, you know, you've got kids who are seeing their mom and dad uh, fighting all the time. They're seeing, for example, the dad hitting the mom or the other way around and that can be very toxic um, for a child to be in that environment or even for an adult um, as an adult and seeing their parents be like that. Okay, now somebody has asked, would you know anyone from FOSIS would be able to come to our college to do a talk on mental health for mental health awareness campaign, inshallah. And it's now I'm going to leave you to that question as it's specifically asking for anybody with Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. If you could um, get in contact with our email address, which is mindoverchatter at process.org.uk, we'll, um, we'll talk about obviously what university you're from and how we can arrange a talk to help your ISOC um, in terms of the mental health awareness campaign. Inshallah. That's Fine. Um, Sidra, did you have any more questions sent to you? Yes, yes, um, I have uh, another question here. And um, if you have anxiety, will it last forever? Uh, so this is again coming back to that all of us can have some kind of um, anxiety, but the problem um, when it's when it's uh, anxiety is a problem is when it's more frequent frequent or severe, severe that you can't uh, can't cope with it and that's when it becomes a problem so in terms of if you're asking if that problematic anxiety will always last forever that depends on how you're able to recognize it, become aware about it, do something about it, reach out to somebody about it, talk to somebody about it, and all of those factors uh, play a role if it will last forever or not. Basically. Um, what friend with polar disorder? What if it comes to a point where you can't talk to them about it or can't leave them either? Okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, uh, what you are saying is that you can't talk to them specifically about bipolar disorder, but you feel like you can't leave them, you can't leave them as a friend, I'm guessing. 
Um, okay, so I would say um, if you feel you cannot talk to them about it, they can always give them alternatives. Give them um, give them suggestions about where they could turn to. And you know, you could say to them, "Listen, you know, I'll, I want to be there for you, um, but I think it would be better for you if you would go to somebody who's more um, uh, maybe professional or more able to help you with things that you need." Because I feel like I'm, I'm not able to do that for you at the moment, but I still want to be friends with you. Just when it comes to that specific thing, I feel like maybe it will be helpful if you if somebody who's more experienced about this, you know, and maybe giving them um, suggestions like the ones I said before, Sukhum um, being one. If you're in Birmingham, there's a place called Birmingham Counseling Services you can turn to. Um, there's also something called Forward Thinking Birmingham. I think it's um, generally something for somebody who goes to a GP, they can be referred to a counselor uh, where NHS pays for six sessions, I think. Um, so, yeah. So, just remember, you can still be there for your friend if you want to be friends with them. Just remember to not make it to an extent where you're compromising yourself and where you're burning yourself out. Do you think we can say we have anxiety without being diagnosed by a professional? Uh, Okay, yes, definitely. Because as I said, um, sorry, two seconds. I just need to put the charge in. Um, yes, we, we can have anxiety without being diagnosed by a professional. So, as I said, diagnosis is not a um, diagnosis as such. And um, there's nothing, so there's nothing where a psychiatrist can diagnose you and say, um, this is what you have, um, and this is the medication you need, for example. Um, what you can do is um, see a professional, so you can go to a psychotherapist, you can go to a counselor, where you talk about this, um, and you go through this if you have, for example, uh, PTSD or, or separate, uh, social anxiety, etc. And, and where to be able to recognize that this is more where you fit into, what kind of anxiety you fit into, and work with that. So this is a big question. Um, do medication help? Are they necessary? Um, this is something big that, that I've had somebody ask me. Uh, okay, we'll take this as the last question. The, if medications help, if they're necessary. Now, I know some people have been told that, uh, you know, don't take medications, it can be really bad for you. Um, whereas some other people have said, do take these medications that the psychiatrist assigns you or the GP gives to you. Now, the thing is, one of the things that happens these days is that a lot of um, antidepressants are given out quite quickly um, to, um, to people. 
um, generally without having gone to anybody, they can just hand out antidepressants and say, this is what you can take and it will help you and not refer you to anything else. Uh, what I believe is sometimes you do need medications. They can be necessary, especially depending on what kind of severity you have um, of uh, mental health struggle that you have. Sometimes you need both and sometimes you just need and both in terms of that you need uh, counseling and you need medication and sometimes you just need counseling so that's not me saying that medications do not help because they can be very helpful for some people but from some for, for some people uh, they just need counseling so it really depends and um, it's not something it's not a clear-cut answer where you can say yes or no to it okay guys um we've learned a lot about a lot over time so that was the last question i'll take if you guys have more questions you're more than welcome to email me and i'll try to answer them as best as i can